Jean Clark, uh, and I'm a longtime abortion rights activist. I ran an abortion clinic for nine years, and during that time, the Women's Law Project represented me on a case. And so I know how important their work is, and I'm constantly in admiration of Carol Tracy more than anybody else because I've known her so long. Um, this is important. We are under attack in a whole lot of different places, in a whole lot of different ways, and we need to stand up and fight back. So my name is Jordan M. Fields. I am currently a dual degree student at Pitt Law in Carnegie Mellon. Um, I think the Women's Law Project is such an important organization. Um, it is uh, vital to the uh, legal battles that are um, currently being thrown at people with uteruses across the country. Um, people like Sue Fritchie uh, have been mentors to people like myself, a lot of law students, a lot of women in Pittsburgh, um, and they serve as inspiration for us all. She has been doing amazing work for decades, as has the Women's Law Project, and so I find um, a lot of the reproductive health work that they do, in particular, uh, to be important, especially at a time like right now, um, where a lot of us and a lot of our reproductive um, laws and, and, and rights are currently coming under attack. So very, very important, very, very grateful for all of the work that the Women's Law Project does, um, and I will continue supporting them uh, however I can. Hi, I'm Sonia Barrero. I'm one of the board members of the Women's Law Project. Um, the Women's Law Project is a fantastic organization and such an asset for our region. Um, the work that they do is uh, just absolutely vital um, and it's all pro bono and um, I think we would be very lost in this uh, region at this particular time without the Women's Law Project. Hi, I'm Stephanie Pashman, and it is really a moment that we all need to be in this room together as women fighting for our rights, particularly reproductive freedom. And I am really thrilled to be here supporting the Women's Law Project to help us lead the way in what is going to be um, a challenging time for women ahead. But it's so important that we come together and do what we can to continue to keep our freedoms, keep our rights, and provide women and access to um, the services that they need. My name is Silas Russell. I'm Executive Vice President of SEIU Healthcare Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's Healthcare Workers Union. We're a union um, that's comprised mostly of women and, and caregiving jobs, and we think uh, an organization like the Women's Law Project is so important in how it stands up to make sure that women's voices are, are both represented and fighting to make sure that we have full equality in every place, including the workforce, um, but also fighting in the front lines to make sure that um, women uh, always have uh, the power to, to win uh, autonomy over their bodies, uh, autonomy over their health care, uh, the ability to have a strong voice in the work that they do, um, whatever that work is. Um, and so for our organization, uh, we're really proud to support the Women's Law Project and all of the work and partner um, with everything that uh, we try to achieve here and we're excited to be back in person. Hi, uh, so my name is Quinn. I work as a counselor at Allegheny Reproductive Health Center. Um, this is Serena and this is Cassie. We all work at the clinic. Um, so obviously one of the biggest issues that we are facing and fighting for right now is access to abortion, um, free and equal access to abortion and making sure that all of our patients have access to that. Um, and not just our patients, but all patients. So that's really, you know, why we're happy to be here surrounded by people who can be our allies in that fight. And I certainly have recommended the Women's Law Project to my patients who are in, you know, tougher situations. So I'm just like very, very grateful to be here surrounded by such inspiring people. Court draft opinion overturning Roe v. Wade, 
Boo. The headlines are growing harder and harder to believe. In fact, I've almost fallen with several of the Onion articles in recent weeks. Um, hey, don't look at me like that. You know that guy's been duped before. It's okay, don't like <laughs> It's like a game of two truths and a lie. Okay, here goes. So one recent fake headline says, New state abortion waiting period law requires women to spend night in creepy old house on a hill. <laughs> and then another one. Missouri welcomes women unable to get arrested for abortion in home state. But that one I really had to think about for a little bit. But wait, here is a real headline. Senator compares protections for fetuses these little eggs and anti-abortion See? It's nearly impossible to distinguish facts from fiction. In all seriousness, the reason the real headlines are so jarring about recent actions taken by state lawmakers is because you're acutely aware that America's on the precipice of rolling back the constitutionally protected abortion rights of the last 50 years. I was speaking to an abortion provider recently, and she said that he's the fear in the face of every single person that walks into her clinic. Why is it so hard for some to believe that a person with a uterus knows what is best for their body? <laughs> it's a near constant state of being disbelieved. Well, we're all here because we believe we believe that in a post world America, the best thing is tools to protect women's rights and access to reproductive health care and freedom is state specific advocacy. And there's no organization better prepared and better poised and no better operation than the Women's Law Project and the brilliant people behind it. <laughs> you can take this fear. And we can turn it into hope, but we can't do it without your help. Speaking of brilliant people, the Women's Law Project, we are so happy that Carol Tracy is here tonight from Philadelphia. <laughs> this is her last right to reality as executive director. I want to personally thank you for your 32 years of dedicated service and leadership at the helm of the Women's Law Project. Carol's also one of our auctioneers this evening in the live auction. We are excited to bring back the annual tradition of Battle of the Auctioneers, where we will determine the winner of the Diva Cup. <laughs> there are some great teams, and I hope to show them some appreciation and bid high. Money made from this auction is going to help the Women's Law Project continue their fight in this year and years to come. Next, I want to remind you all to vote on Say What. In the vein of the Onion article, we have some truly and real outrageous quotes from public figures this year, and we need your help figuring out which one is the worst. We'll hear the winner from our board survey and TV later in the minute. Now, it's my pleasure to bring senior staff attorney and director of the Pittsburgh Office of the Women's Law Project for teaching stage. Hi. Wow. It's so it's full. The room is absolutely like really, really full. And if you have ever had wonderful experience of planning an event like this. That is like such a wonderful feeling and I'm feeling like I'm the thanks to the annual Alito show. Or not. <laughs> um, I am really, really happy to be back in person with all of you. It feels like it has been an eternity since we were together in person. 
and your next one has lost all of my social skills that we've all been just very kind to me to know anyway. Um, so first things first, I want to thank the staff at the Saturday for hosting us tonight. For the wonderful food and drink, they have been very hard working and we really appreciate their labor. And thanks to my wonderful co-workers who drove here across the state to this event. Uh, Carol Tracy, Dan Miller, Christine Castro, Richie Quinn, as well as the home team, who's here as well. Uh, Brittany Dean, Pam Patterson, Maggie Neely, Nina Lagarde, and Lisa McCarty. Our board of trustees, our host committee, our volunteers and interns, our co council, our funders, our clients are here. Right. Um, our celebrity guest auctioneers, can't wait. And all of the sponsors and attendees, including people joining us remotely via live stream tonight. So thank you all so much for coming. And thank you for sticking with us throughout the COVID years and keeping our doors open for 20 years. There's only so much pain you can get into a single event, so we didn't really promote this event as our 20th anniversary year, but it is. We opened in 2003 last year, and it has been 20 years that you have made it possible for us to do litigation and public advocacy and to free to people who have no other access to a lawyer um, on a whole range of different issues, equal pay, Title IX and credit, sexual harassment, LGBTQ rights, pregnancy accommodations. There are so many ways to oppress women and LGBT people, and we are trying to work on all of them and fix all of them. Um, tonight, though, I'm going to focus not surprisingly, on what is truly a tragedy. I'm going to focus on the loss of the world And I'm not going to do a scholarly analysis of that disgusting, arrogant, archaic, mean, poor reason, no reason, White male supremacist bad first class. <laughs> Other people have done that very good well. It's almost, it's almost impossible to to keep reading them. Um, tonight, though, I don't have that much time with you, and I want to talk about what are we going to do? Um, what do we do? So for almost half a century, I've had a tremendous uh, time representing the Board of Supervisors. The Women's Law Project was there from 1974 on. I joined in 1992. So for almost half a century, this organization has represented the two standing clinics in Pennsylvania, including our women who failed to help them. You know, and in all those 50 years, including in 1992, when we really thought we were going to lose the right altogether, we have never faced what we're facing now. So, let's take a look at what we're facing now. So, for many of you, this map is already burned in your brain. This is a map of the 26 states expected to immediately or very quickly criminalize abortion when the Supreme Court issues its actual decision in Dobbs versus Johnson and his health organization, as opposed to its tracking first draft. This will likely happen by the end of June. Um, and you can see that Pennsylvania is not counted among those 26 prohibition states. Uh, 
that he came to change as early as January if the governor's race goes in particular way, and even if the governor's race is won, it could change as soon as next May if our opponents amend our state constitution to amend away any state constitutional right to abortion. So this is a very, you know, that looking at the color on that map is not really important at all. But for now, for the present moment, we are not one of the prohibition states. But what is important about this map is how very close to us the prohibition states are. Right? So in Alabama County, we are a center for abortion care. And this is something to be tremendously proud of. Uh, we know that when we deny someone a wanted abortion, uh, it has a catastrophic effect on their life in the short term and on the long term. It inflicts physical and mental suffering, long term health and economic consequences that affect the whole family. So we are proud of and very protective of our abortion providers in Pennsylvania. Um, the allergies of cancer providers are the only ones between here and Harrisburg. So they cover a vast amount of the state. They provide about 6,500 abortions a year. After God, an estimated 100,000 patients from prohibition states will be crossing state lines to find care. Now, some people will be getting medication abortion through the mail, some people will be self-managing their abortion, and some people will have no choice but to continue pregnancies they do not want to connect to state. But 100,000 people are estimated to be the travelers, and analysts have identified Pittsburgh as one of five places in the country expecting the largest patient service. And you can see just from looking at, look at that map, you can see a look at that. You can see Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee. These are all prohibitions. So up here, uh, this is Michigan up there. We are expecting to get a lot of patients from Michigan, Ohio, and West Virginia, and also these states here um, when the Illinois clinic samples will be there. Um, so that means that even if we succeed in keeping abortion legal here and protected, it means it's still going to be pretty rough to find an appointment. And pregnancy is time sensitive, it doesn't wait. So, what we're looking at is a near future where not only will patients from the prohibition states be traveling here, but patients are going to be traveling to New York and New Jersey and Canada because of lack of capacity. That's my problem if you have a car and if you have. Well, he's the best, and the hell, and Christ, and all the rest, but, you know, what about people who don't? So, it is going to require a monumental community response to meet this challenge. We are acting really a peaceful state in this regard, and we have to keep our status as a legal state where abortion is accessible, not just for people from here from the United States, for us, for the whole region. Um, supporters of reproductive health rights and justice who are living in western Pennsylvania, and I think that's all of you, right? Um, we really have a special role and a special responsibility at this moment in history. So, what are we going to do? We have a plan. We have a five-point plan. 
This is the plan that we have been working on at the Women's Law Project. Go in formation, but I wanted to share it with you so you get a sense of the breadth of the work and the demands that are out there. Um, so the first part of the plan is to support the provider, and this is our primary role as their counsel. It includes advocating the state regulate, regulates for more flexible models of medical abortion care, including telemedicine, and more flexible facility construction guidelines and facility regulation. Uh, if we have to absorb our share of 100,000 additional patients, we might need to build more facilities. Um, very difficult under our current system. Um, second, expand judicial bypass. You know, you probably all know judicial bypass is the legal proceeding where a person under the age of 18 must go before a judge and prove that they are mature enough to make a decision about their pregnancy in order to be allowed to consent to care without prior consent. So in anticipation of the Dobbs ruling, um, the Women's Law Project represents all judicial bypass petitioners that come before judges and all of them can. And we draw comments from we're already drawing them to West Virginia and Ohio, where judicial bypass is very difficult. Um, we've expanded our capacity to do that representation. And I think that we are we will be able to double or triple that capacity in very small order. So I have to give a lot of credit to my colleague Christine Castro for developing uh, many of the procedures uh, that we're using in these uh, judicial bypass hearings. And they're inherently intrusive, they're inherently terrifying. I think they're really cruel. Um, but we are managing, I think, to make them as accessible, calm, and respectful as possible. And we will be able to absorb lots more. Third, defend pregnant people. So when abortion is criminalized, pregnancy is police. And when there is a pregnancy law, it is not possible to tell the difference between a miscarriage and a pregnancy loss caused by another person. So when abortion is criminalized, pregnancy is police. And in particular, Pregnant people of color of The National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers has issued a report that I hope everyone reads, finding that without the constitutional protection of Roe versus Wade, many states can and will pass laws inflaming the national crisis of overcriminalization and mass incarceration. So we do not want that to happen in the future. We are working with criminal defense attorneys to prepare for prosecutions of pregnant people and especially to ward off other states who think that they can reach into Pennsylvania with subpoenas and extradition money. And that work is happening now. We're also, on the civil side, uh, defending pregnant people at work and at school. And this is an expansion of some of the earlier work that we've been doing. Just this past Mother's Day, we launched a legal, legal navigator program to help pregnant and lactating workers and students in Western Pennsylvania know more about what their rights are and not have to choose between having a healthy pregnancy and staying employed or staying in school. Ina Lavelle and Maggie Neely are spearheading this effort in Western Pennsylvania. So please spread the word. Fourth, stop getting crisis pregnancy center. So I can say this because this work is basically being done by um, my colleague Carol Murtha and Amal Bass 
in Philadelphia, we are really one of the leading organizations nationally going on the effective against these equality institutions. Um, Carol Murka, who is our communications director, uh, wrote an extraordinary report on crisis pregnancy centers, and if you want to stay awake all night, you can do it because it is scary. It is entitled The CPC Industry as a Surveillance Tool of the Post Rose Kick. So you can go there, they trust, they get their way, they get their last natural period. Um, what happens to that information? Well, it doesn't take up the country. And they read the report. Very interesting. Uh, finally, we are seeking to establish a strong safe based way to abortion through the Pennsylvania Equal Rights Amendment and the uh, safety protection provision of our state This, above everything else, gives me so much hope. If you can do this, despite the loss of pride on the federal level, our state constitution could provide independent protection for reproductive rights and possibly, conceivably, better protection. Our challenge to the Medicaid abortion coverage team, Allegheny Reproductive Health Center, which is the Department of Human Services. <laughs> And it is at last before the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. It is fully brief. We are told that we will have oral arguments. We are waiting for the argument day to be set. And then we expect that will happen probably in September, October. And then sometime after that, the court will be set. In the meantime, our opponents. Apparently, we think we're going to win because they are trying to amend our constitutional claims out from under us. This up here is a proposed state constitutional amendment uh, that would eliminate any right to abortion from our state constitution. And take a look at it. The policy of Pennsylvania is to protect the life of every unborn child from conception to birth. This it becomes part of the Constitution, uh, it affects so much more than just abortion funding. And that first sentence, I think we can say goodbye to the fertilization, many forms of birth control, and the autonomy of every pregnant person in this case. Uh, it is coming to a full Senate vote in 10 days, we heard today. Of that became, but that's the schedule right now. So it is moving, and we must stop it. This is not something that our government can do. Our constitutional amendments can go through them. They go directly from the legislature to the electorate, and this could be our next major battle. So that's our, that's our plan, and this is quite ambitious. Um, so now we want to talk for a few minutes about how you can help right now, because we have this massive organizational challenge in front of us. There is so much to do, and it cannot be done by a staff of two or four, right? So um, let's look at some of the things we can do right away. So first of all, um, there is a rally tomorrow at noon. And I hope to see you there at the city planning building. There's also a rally uh, at I believe one o'clock in Harrisburg. And hopefully many of the people in this room can be at one or the other. Um Tuesday is election day. I know I don't have to say what you could do. Um, we need to support the patients who will be coming to Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvanians who will be having to travel to other states. And that is a tremendously labor-intensive and expensive 
proposition that every single person we help is a person who has succeeded in frustrating the moral and the moral and the If you, um, if you look on the table, there's the virtual program, and there's a QR code on there. And um, if you click on that and scroll down, you will see a graphic of a human holding a heart. And um, that will lead you to a place where you can volunteer to be a patient support. It's just for an organized city patient, but we need you. We're going to need you to drive. We're going to need you possibly to find lodging for people, uh, possibly to do child care, possibly to find funding um, for patients' abortions. Um, so please, please, if you have any interest in that at all, um, visit that site and sign up. We need. And that's because this summer, this topic is actually, there's a lot to know about. Even just educating yourself about the constitutional amendment and what it means and what the process is, it actually requires a fair amount of public education. And there's an awful lot of misinformation out there. So this summer, we want to have a million speaking engagements. I don't know if some of you maybe remember when we held 20 house parties in West Santa Monica because of Betsy DeVos and her father fighting non sexual harassment. Well, we want to blow that out of the water. Only if we do that, the rest of the staff will quit. So I need other speakers. So we would really appreciate people signing up for a speaker's training. So that we can generate the speaking engagements that we currently do not have capacity to fully staff. So please let the Women's Law Project know if that's something you can do, and we will take care of that. Okay. Um, the constitutional amendment getting voted in the Senate in 10 days. We have a small number of organizations on record opposing it. It has news quickly. We have to move quickly too. So can you get your organization, your business, your community group, your religious organization, whatever, to issue a statement opposing it and to get it to us? And we will compile all of that and make sure that is in the record before the vote. Um, medical organizations, we have very, very few of them. Um, so this is a priority for us. It's something we'll be working on throughout the summer. But anyone who can get their statement in now, please do it. Individual letters as well. They absolutely matter. Uh, we might not have the vote to stop it in the Senate, but a lot of noise can slow a bill down. So we must make a lot of noise. And then finally, Fighting abortion stigma, this is how we got into this to begin with, right? Everyone is too uh, embarrassed or private or ashamed or guilty or, or something, you know, trying to be polite and wanting to raise a controversial subject and, you know, it's about sex and no one wants to talk about that or the dinner party. But, you know, we have to not do that anymore. We really have to not do that anymore. We really need to be forthright and unapologetic and loud about the importance of reproductive self-determination to our very humanity. So, there I am completely sure that there is a place for every single person here in this world. And it's tricky finding the perfect job for everybody, but that is what we're devoting ourselves to. And if you need, if you're not doing anything that you want to do, or if you're doing something that is not really very meaningful to you, please be in touch with us. This is our work for the foreseeable future. And, you know, what's happening is horrifying. 
but we are not powerless. So, I'll see you before. Now for the hard part of most students. Yeah. So I got um, to welcome Sarah to the stage. So now I get to get you back. <laughs> During Carol's 32 year career as executive director, he has announced an absolutely stunning record of achievement that would be the enemy of organizations many, many times larger than the women's ball hockey. I only have a short time here tonight, so I can't really begin to do justice to Carol's legacy. She has been a vocal, tireless, zealous champion of control facilities, of domestic and sexual assault survivors, a feminist pitfall. <laughs> Whoever falls for that, you thought it would make her mad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going around the office for weeks after she was done in But always, Carol has been a defender of the powerless and the disenfranchised. She developed and found funding for the Women's Law Project Food Productive Rights Program and kept it alive throughout some very lean years. She's the innovator of the Philadelphia Case Review Model for Sexual Assault Complaints, a model that we would like to see implemented here in Pittsburgh. She challenged the once common practice of excluding pregnant women from addic with addictions from drug treatment programs and the criminalization of pregnant women to no more conduct in more than a dozen states. She is a convener of the Coalition for the Welfare of Women and Children, which for years fought welfare cuts and family health. The list goes on and on. And all the while she was doing this, she was keeping the lights on and keeping the staff relatively okay. <laughs> so, Carol, you're not leaving that because you were definitely not allowed to leave before the Bob's decision. So, I'm not saying you Bob, but I am saying thank you. So, you're selling the season. Among which, the following. I'm so lucky to do pretty much anything I want to do, including me back here and all kinds of fun, and to be my mentor and my dear friend. I do always say that my greatest talent has been to hire the people. Um, and clearly, that's what she was concerned But I, 
I always remember when she was driving back and forth to Pittsburgh, and thought, I'm worried she's going to, you know, be in an accident along the turnpike. So, I'll put the hell, one thing I can do is to do it. And fortunately, I had a board that needed to pay attention. <laughs> Um, another one of my skills. <laughs> um, anyway, um, you have heard from Stuart when you first met him. And for so all of you, you know, do take comfort that the legal staff stays in place when I leave. Um, what I am clear about for my future is I have done as much as I can in the job I have had. I think the future is really about voting and electoral politics. Work I have not been able to do in a father wants to be pre-organization, and I am not saying what I'm going to do now, um, but in July we will do it, um, because I'm not going to work. Um, I think those of us who have been around doing this work for more than five decades, like me, and some of my friends are too far from the audience. We've been there and we were there. Um, I was, you know, in high school watching my schoolmates go to um, underground places to get abortions, um, drop out of high school. It was illegal, it was criminal. Um, I'm really, quite frankly, pissed off that we're back there again, or we will be back there again. But we know what to do about it, um, and we just have to dig in, and there's just no opportunity to sit back. Um, we can't do it, and we're not going to do it, because we, we just, we are just not going back to those days. Who so out on what we all have to do, um, and each and every one, and every one you know who cares, just has to be an actor. That's what I think about. that. So, I just want to thank you. It's been wonderful. I love coming to Pittsburgh. Um, uh, I love seeing all of you. Um, and um, I'm going to be part of an auction, and you, you have to go to me to be the deal. But, uh, <laughs> Um, except when it comes time to do some kind of gross thing. That <laughs> the kids are going to get away with all of this. Thanks, everybody.